Hey, everybody. Welcome to uh, BME Better Man interview. I'm sorry we're a couple of minutes late. I'm sorry for that jumpy start, but we are delighted that you've joined us today. We're thrilled that you have um, taken the time out of your schedule to hear some incredible story today from our friend Michael McDowell. Let me introduce Michael to you. I am sure that Michael needs no introduction to many of you. Michael wears the number 34 for Front Row Motorsports. Former Rookie of the Year, his career quickly accelerated, pun intended, and his growing stature uh, within NASCAR. This weekend, he's back at Daytona, one of, uh, I understand, his favorite places where six of his first seven top 10 finishes happened. I believe that's right, Michael. Michael is a husband to Jamie, dad to Trace, Emma, Riley, and Lucas, and a hero for many NASCAR fans around the country. In addition to being a NASCAR driver, husband, and dad, Michael is committed to becoming a better man because of the work of Christ in his life. Would you join me as you're watching and welcoming Michael McDowell to our Better Man conversation? Welcome, Michael. Hey, thanks for having me on. That was quite the introduction right there. That was that was really nice, Andy. Thank you. Yeah, I have been working on it for weeks now, so uh, <laughs> lots of practice. Michael, tell us where you're you're speaking to us from. I mean, exactly where you're speaking to us from. Yeah, right now I'm in, I'm in the infield actually of uh, of Daytona International Speedway um, in the driver owner motorhome lot. Um, you know, obviously with uh, a lot of COVID restrictions and, you know, there's been an event with a lot of fans and things like that. We're, we're sort of quarantined to our, our little box here. But, um, yeah, so I'm in the infield here and, um, and just hanging out and having some fun with you guys. And uh, later on tonight, there'll be a, a truck race kicking off here. So um, I'll, I'll watch that inside and then hear all the fun noise and, and hopefully get a good night's rest after that. But, um, yeah, for the for the next few days, I'll be right here in the uh, the motorhome hanging out. Well, that's great, and we're so grateful that you've taken uh, the time out of your preparations for Sunday to join us. Now, Michael, I'm sure as someone who um, rides at very fast speeds, you don't get nervous very often, but I am a little bit nervous. So I'd like to start our interview, if I can, with just some quick icebreaker questions, right? All One right. or two word answers, right? Okay. What is the fastest you have ever driven? Uh, 225 miles an hour. Gotcha. You know, I think my wife was pretty close coming home from the store the other day. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> what's, um, what's your favorite track to race? Favorite track is Road America. It's a road course. Okay. Uh, what's your go-to excuse should you ever get a speeding ticket? I didn't know what the speed limit was. It's pretty much my go-to. There you go. Which that's... is usually true. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Uh, you're you're a dad. Uh, you got some uh, young ladies in your family, so I'm sure you watch Disney movies. Who's your favorite Disney princess? Oh man, um, I do watch a lot of Disney movies. Um, <laughs> that's probably not a question you get very often. No, it's not. Yeah, I, I don't know. Is 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 Elsa a princess? I mean, I think she would be considered a princess, right? Uh, I'm looking at my audience. Can we? Yeah, it, yes, for sure. Can, my little can, girls would say yes. Yeah, we can confirm that uh, Elsa is a princess, <laughs> but we had to get a, a, a judge's adjudication on that. <laughs> uh, who was your hero growing up? Yeah, my hero growing up, um, probably my dad. Okay, nice. Nice, nice, nice. Well, let's, let's kind of move into some uh, deeper topics and conversations and uh, let's keep this free flowing. And to those who are uh, watching, uh, if you have any questions for Michael, please put them in the chat or in the comment section and uh, we'll try and get to them before the truck race starts a little <laughs> later this evening. Uh, Michael, first question, what's the, what's the biggest thrill that you have experienced on the track? Biggest thrill on the racetrack. Um, man, it's hard to pinpoint one, one event. I mean, I think I could pinpoint three or four, but the, um, you know, the biggest thrill would probably be making my first Daytona 500. 
Um, last night we had the, the qualifying races. It, it used to be called the Gatorade duel. Um, uh, but we had the duels last night and, and in years past, I would have had to race my way into the Daytona 500. Uh, so racing my way into the, my first ever Daytona 500 is, um, would probably definitely rank up there on the, the list. That, that is a, a, a big deal, a big, big, big deal. Um, just looking uh, at some of the, the, the things that uh, written about USC online, it seems like you've always been involved in racing, right? I understand it was BMX's first, and then it was karting, where I understand you got, got pretty good, and open wheel Grand Am, and on and on and on. What, what is it that you, you love about racing and, and about competition? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, once you get the, the racing bug and, um, you know, it, it's, it's there for a long time, you know, forever, you know, I think that the, what I enjoy the most about it is um, just how hard you have to push yourself. Um, and, and there's, you know, there's, there's times you win, there's times you lose. And, but finding gratification in the effort that you put in, um, and just, you know, the, the amount of discipline it takes to, to make it to this level. Mm -hmm. t t tell us about this, th that discipline. What, what does it take? What are some of the rhythms and kind of routines in, in, in your life that help you discipline yourself for, for something like this? Yeah, I think it, you know, as just like any profession or, or I think in life, you know, as you mature and as you grow older and life changes, that that rhythm changes and and you you sort of have to adjust. And, um, you know, but as far as, you know, my day to day, you know, it's it used to be before family that this is all I ever thought about. You know, if, if even if I wasn't at the shop or I wasn't at the racetrack, I was still thinking about, you know, how can I be better? How could I approach this corner different? What do we need to do to our setups? Um, you know, I have my own little library of notes, you know, from every weekend and every practice and, and every run that I've made and making notes. This is where I break. This is what I did. Um, and, and so, you know, but as life changes, you know, that that definitely changes as well. So it's it's not so much finding balance as it is just making uh, your time count with whatever you're doing. And so being intentional about that time. And so uh, when I go to the shop, I make sure that that time is, is intentional. I'm getting the most out of it. And, and when I'm at home, you know, I'm trying to make sure that I'm on my game and I'm focused and being intentional about that. And uh, because I'm not always there. Right. And so I don't want to, I don't want to waste the time. I want to be intentional with it. And even this week, you know, I've been gone, you know, from my family this week and, um, trying to make this time intentional. Like now that I, yeah, I can't see my family this week, um, making it count in areas that, that are important to make it count. So I think it's just, um, you know, just organizing and being intentional with anything you do and, and not being idle. You know, if you're not pushing yourself to, to be better, if you're not pushing yourself in all those areas, um, you know, I just think about it as, is you're either, you're either floating downstream or you're swimming upstream. And, um, if you're not swimming, if you're not paddling, you are floating downstream. And so, uh, just, just about staying paddling. Yeah, that's, that, that, that's good. The, um, irony is not lost on me that as a racing driver, you don't like to idle, right? Yeah. yeah. That's, uh, that, that's good. So Michael, as we're, um, looking at you, uh, today in, in all your, your gear, uh, we see lots of, lots of sponsors on your, your jacket. And uh, you are very intentional uh, about the sponsorships you get because you want sponsors that reflect, I understand, your core values. H how would you define those, those core values that govern your life? Uh, I mean, I, I keep it super simple and it's love God and love people. And, and for me, in, in a you know, sport, obviously, that has a lot of, a lot of people watching and um, who I represent on the racetrack and the brands that I partner with, you know, is a, a reflection of me and it's a reflection of their organizations. And, um, and so, you know, as an outspoken Christian and as somebody that, you know, I just want to make it, I want to make it count when I'm here. Um, you know, it's very important who I'm aligned with, you know, and, and that it, it, um, you know, it fits who I am and, and what I believe. And, 
Um, so it's, it's tricky. That's a tough part. It's been a tough part of my career because there's been lots of opportunities or potential opportunities, you know, had I done things a little differently. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that, that, that's good. Thanks for, for sharing that. You know, you mentioned about your faith and one of the defining uh, parts of your life is certainly you, you, your faith and you compete as a faith-based driver Tell us a little bit how you came to put your faith in, in Christ and how that faith has developed. Yeah, the, you know, for time's sakes, the shortened version is, is that, you know, I didn't grow up um, in the church, so to speak. I grew up in a great home with two loving parents, um, but it wasn't gospel centered. Um, you know, church wasn't a part of our life. And, um, but my, like I said, I grew up with a great family and, and, and morals and doing the right thing. And, um, and so I felt like I had a very good foundation. Um, but it just took two people investing in me and being intentional. Um, that really just softened my heart towards, you know, the, the things of God and, um, you know, lots of circumstances in your life. And, and, you know, we all go through them. I, I call them those aha moments where, um, you know, God is just pursuing you and, and God pursued me through a couple of men that were living their lives. Um, you know, they were living out their faith and, and there was something different about them. And that, that gospel, you know, centered life is what was attractive. And, and so it took two men just being intentional with me that really brought me to a relationship with Christ. Mm. That's a, that, that's a powerful story as well. And I think, you know, I have the share the same story and I'm sure many watching do as well that um, that, that example uh, of pouring your life into another is is so so important and, and and what's become of your career and your life is a, a testimony to that I, I understand that that um, commitment to Christ came after a tough year around the track um, where you'd experienced a, a very nasty crash a very dangerous crash um, there are probably some men who are watching this interview today who have had crashes in their life, probably not at hundreds of miles an hour on a track, um, but they've crashed in other ways. Maybe their uh, relationships have crashed, their career plans have crashed, their, their dreams have crashed. What, what did you learn through your defining crash that is... Um, that has been helpful to you that perhaps you could share to help other men get through their crashes? Yeah, definitely. I think um, I'll answer it in two parts. So I, I became a, a Christian in uh, 2004. So I was 21 or 22 years old. I saw somebody in the, uh, the chat there asking. Um, and, and really just, like I said, not growing up in the church and, and, and being a new believer, you know, I felt like I took this this uh, free gift that, that God has given us, you know, through his son. And I kind of put it in my back pocket, so to speak. And, and, you know, it felt good. And I felt like, Oh man, I'm saved. And I know where I'm going. Um, but it didn't, it didn't affect every area of my life. And, and the reason that was, is I still had my guard up, you know, I, I felt like, you know, God, I, I need you here and I need you here and I need you here. But this racing thing, like, I don't want you to interfere with that because it's going good. Right. Yeah. Um, and so to fast forward, you know, to go from 2004 and five to 2008, where I had that big crash, um, it was was, a, you know, a time of me learning, you know, just things that, you know, I think that people that grow up in church, you know, take for granted, like, you know, I, what's the Trinity? That doesn't make any sense to me. What are all these things? And so I was I was digging in the word and, and growing and learning, but I, I didn't allow God into every area of my life. And that crash was very eye-opening to me. Um, not from the walking away standpoint. I mean, that when people see it, they, you see it and it, it's miraculous that I walk away and, um, and I totally get it. I, I don't downplay that part of it. Like God absolutely had his hand, you know, protection on me that day, but more so was the opportunity that came after it. And so I went from this rookie that nobody really knew. And, you know, I was, uh, I wasn't a high profile guy and, um, and I had this big crash and, you know, the next day I'm, you know, I'm on a media tour and I'm on the today show and I'm on good morning America. I'm on Ellen and I'm 
flying here and flying there and on NASCAR's private jet. And they're, they're taking me all around because people want to talk about this crash. And so um, that was the real challenging part of, of my, my crash was, um, you know, I saw it on, on a, a replay and I just, man, this is a great opportunity for my career. Mm. You know, am I going to make this a great opportunity for my career or and am I going to take this opportunity to make God known? Wow. And so that, that was where I was really challenged. Like God really challenged me. Is this about you or is this about me? Mm-hmm. And, and so that was when I took that, that free gift and, and let it, you know, let God in and invited him into every aspect of my life, including my career um, and my platform. And, and so it wasn't about building my brand or, or my name or my social media following. It was about, you know, just sharing the goodness of God and his faithfulness mm-hmm. and making him known. Um, and so that was, that was a big shift. You know, that was one of those major shifts in life, um, where I feel like I finally fully surrendered where I got to a point where I'm like, all right, God have it all. Every area it's yours. And it was always his anyways. It was his from the beginning. I just thought that I had a little bit of control and, and obviously I didn't. Yeah. Wow. What a, what a, what a powerful story. And, um, thank you for not, uh, letting that story be about you, right? Um, you know, spotlight is a is a dangerous thing in any walk of life, and you're in it a lot. And to reflect that spotlight to to God, I think, is pleasing to Him and and, and helpful to to all of us. Um, but, but as a driver, the spotlight is on you a lot. Um, but racing really is a team sport. And you have a crew around you who are helping you and supporting you and winning with you. Um, what's, a, what's a correlation? What's an overlap between having the importance of having a crew in the race, but also having a crew in life as well? I know that we know that a lot of men go through life alone, but yeah. we're not supposed to do that. What are some of the things that your crew in the track teaches you about the importance of having um, influential, helpful, supportive friends in your life? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think that, you know, it's very easy to see how how the two correlate. And, you know, the my race car doesn't make it on the racetrack without my crew. I mean, I'd love to tell you that I could take care of it all, but I can't. And um, And, you know, there's aspects of the race car that I'm probably pretty – pretty familiar with and pretty good but um you know it takes a a whole organization uh to to be able to do this but um it's not just a crew it's the right crew right and i think that um you know Mm -hmm. for me in in my walk and in my faith you know the big part of it for my growth and and for me to just mature in my faith and mature as a a father and a husband is is to have people that are investing in me while i'm still investing in others and and I think that both elements are super important. And, um, and so it's, it's the same on the race team. You know, I, I, I have a crew chief and, um, you know, I don't think that he, I would admit this to him, but he's sort of my boss uh, when we're on the racetrack. Uh, but he answers to the team manager and he's got somebody to look up to and he's got some, but he's also pouring in the five or six guys um, below him that are, you know, crucial part of the race team. And so, um, you know, the Bible just tells us that, you know, as iron sharpens iron, so does another man sharpen another man. And so I feel like we know that it's biblical to, to be in community and to be in fellowship with other believers. Um, but also, I don't know if you know how iron is sharpened, but it's sharpened with, you know, metal hitting metal. And so you, you don't need to just be plugged into a, you know, I'm doing great. Everything's great. Uh, you need to be with people that you can do life with real life that are going to say, Hey, what, how about this area of your life? Or how are your quiet times? And, you know, how you've been doing, you know, leading your family and, and, and people that are going to challenge you to be better. Um, and then that's going to help you challenge others to be better as well. And so um, you definitely got to have the right, right group of people around you to grow in your faith. I love that. That's, uh, that's great. I hope, hope some of our uh, viewers captured that 
as well. Maybe just a couple more questions from me, then we'll go to questions in the chat. And uh, friends, if you have a question, drop it in the chat and the comment section, and uh, we'll try to get to it. Um, Michael, during our conversation, we've talked a lot about investing and making an impact. Uh, I read a quote from you earlier today that said, the area between your feet is your mission field. I explain that to us. Yeah, so I just want to clarify. I stole that quote. I just don't know where I stole it from. Oh, well, that's um, some close work, right? First, yeah, yeah. I once heard, and as yeah. I've always said. <laughs> yeah, so, um, you know, you know, your mission field is the area between your feet at any given moment. And so I think that people think, well, you're a NASCAR driver. And, and so you have this platform and you have this following or you're on TV or you get invited to all these things. And so you have a platform, but I don't really have a platform. I just go to my nine to five and I, I'm a dad and you know, but nobody really cares what I have to say. And, and I'm always, I always challenge that of like, your area between your feet is your mission field. So if you're at work, that's your mission field. The, the people around you need to see and hear the gospel. You need to be investing in those people around you and making a difference in their life. And, and when you're home, that area is, is your mission field, is leading your family and, and loving your family well and, and, and being the head of your household and, and being a good steward of that. And when you're in the grocery store and you're standing in line, like you're a reflection, you are a reflection of God. You're made in his image. We're the only thing made in God's image. And so we are a reflection of, of his goodness and his faithfulness and his love. And so wherever we're at, doesn't matter where we're at, we do have a mission field. And so you don't need this platform or uh, the perception of a platform to, to share the gospel, to love people uh, and to make an impact. Mm. That's, that's fantastic. Last, last question from me, then we'll jump to the chat. There are many who are watching this who may be feeling like the tread on their tires has gone. Perhaps they're moving too fast, feel like they're positioning for a crash. There'll be some men here who are just idling their way through life in neutral. If you could say one thing to men, what would you say? I don't know if I can narrow it down to, to one thing, but uh, the question that you, you said there definitely sparked something in me and um, just talking about spinning your tires, right? And, and tires being bald and traction, obviously that's not good for speed, right? Um, but in life, what I've learned is, is I'm, I'm intense. I mean, I am like, I am always intense. And in my spiritual life and in my walk, I've, I've learned that with my intensity, it's very easy for me to get ahead of God. Mm. And, and I, as soon as I'm ahead of God, that's when I start spinning my tires. Mm. And so because I'm a charger and I want to go and I want to go and I want to go, but a lot of times it's not that for me. A lot of times it's, it's backing it down and, and just being faithful what, with what he's already asked me to do mm -hmm. and, and not trying to take on the next thing and not trying to take on the next you know, opportunity or next Bible study, even if it's good things, you know, like just being faithful with what God has given you already, you know, that's your, your family and your marriages and all these things, just be faithful in what he's already asked you to do. And so I have spent a lot of my time spinning my tires because I'm trying to get ahead of God. And, and so for me, I actually have to back it down. Um, idol is, is not, not an issue for me. It's backing it down. And so um, you know, if I had one thing to tell men that the most important thing that I've learned in, in my life and in my walk with the Lord is have a quiet time every single day, mm. have a quiet time. If you are not in God's word and you're not having quiet times, then you're either idling or you're spinning your tires. Mm. And, and so that quiet time, that is you, that is your compass. That is how you are in tune with what God has for you in your life. And um, it's so easy to get out of whack when we don't have those intentional times in the word and, and in our quiet times. Man, that is so, that is so good. That is, uh, that is rich. Just taking some notes here of that to me, underlining it and putting an exclamation point by it. Uh, let's just jump to the questions in the chat, just reviewing some of them. Um, some of them can be answered by Google. So uh, I would encourage people to, to do that. So I'm going to like lean into some of the more personal questions, if that's okay. Uh, how do you deal with conflict and controversy with other drivers? 
Yeah, so this part is is tricky, but you know, I I I separate the two, right? So when I'm on track, I'm driving my race car. Now I'm still a Christian on the track, and I still want to live my life as a reflection of Christ. But it says that if we're gonna do the race, that we should do the race as we're trying to win it, right? And 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 that's taken it out of context, but it's like a runner runs the race to win, right? And the race that we're trying to win is is the race of life, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but in the in the, the racing context for me, what that is is that when I'm on the racetrack, I'm gonna go all out. I'm gonna lay it all out on the line. And if I run into you and I crash you and, and things happen, that is the sport. If if I was the was paid to play football, I'm gonna hit you as hard as I can. Yeah, I'm not going to take a cheap shot at you and I'm not going to make an illegal move at you, but I'm going to hit you as hard as I can because I get paid to hit you. And if God has given me the opportunity to be in that 1% that makes it, I'm going to hit you as hard as I can every time I can. Um, and so on the racetrack, it's a little bit different, obviously, but I'm going to race as hard as I can. And, and if we, if we have an altercation on the racetrack, it's because I was racing as hard as I can. And obviously you make mistakes and things like that. So I separate the two. Um, when I, when I get off the track, how I deal with conflict is, is, is not running away from it. It's being honest with people and it's just, you know, if you made a mistake, it's going up and saying, Hey, I made a mistake. If it wasn't a mistake and you're just racing hard, you know, it's just being reasonable. Right. Um, and a lot of times, you know, racing, they stick the camera in your face and, uh, you say, you know, stupid things and, or somebody says stupid things and, you know, I just kind of brushed that all off. It's like, you know, we're, we're all fallen uh, and we all miss the mark. And in the heat of the moment, it's, you know, it's a challenge, but how you respond after is very important. And I've found that it's a great, great way to, uh, to build a relationship with people is after you've had conflict and how you resolve conflict is, is a huge part of, you know, building a relationship. Mm. That is, that is better man gold right there. There's some real nuggets there. Uh, Michael, another question, a couple uh, about COVID-19. I'm going to rephrase them a, a little bit. Uh, how have you become a better man through COVID-19? Um, I think it, it's, it's been tough. It, I think how I've, uh, it's a tough question. You know, it's been it's a hard time for me. Um, I think it's been a hard time for a lot of people. And it's not the for me, it's not been physical or any of those things. Uh, we've been healthy. It's just being home uh, with my my family for that much time without having any outlets. And so for me, how it's made me a better man is just learning to enjoy being at home more and, and doing more of the mundane things uh, with the kids and playing cards and playing games and um, you know, I'm, a, like I said, I'm a pretty intense guy and obviously adrenaline junkie. I, I drive race cars, you know, 200 miles an hour. So sitting at home, I'm like, ah, oh, what are we doing? You know? And so just enjoying that time more and, and being more intentional about it. Good, 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 good answer. Um, just maybe a couple more, um, because I know it's going to get real loud where you are real soon. Yeah, you're, you're good right now. I can hear them just starting to warm up a little bit. When it gets real loud, we'll know. Okay. <laughs> um, before and after, what? How would you describe your life before Christ, and how would you summarize your life having met Christ? Um, I would summarize my life before Christ as just selfish, mm-hmm. and um, after knowing Christ, I, I would. I would summarize my life with um, meaningful, hmm. right? It's purposeful, like like it's not just for nothing, right? And you know, Ecclesiastes, when it talks about it, it's all meaningless, it's meaningless, it's meaningless. Is that um, apart from Christ, uh, a lot of this can be meaningless. And um, but with Christ, it has eternal meaning, eternal value. So uh, it's definitely given me a sense of purpose. That's good. What what does what does NASCAR as an organization um, feel about your Christian voice? I, I feel fairly supported um, in general in our sport. I think that this you know foundationally our sport is uh, I would say is a sport that has been 
um, very receiving and, you know, we always pray before the race. There's always a prayer before the, you know, the national anthem, um, you know, the invocation is an important part, you know, but as this world is just changing and evolving around us, like it, it seems like it's getting more and more of a challenge. Right. And, and it, it's almost like they want, they want a tamer version of Christianity and, um, you know, people are okay with you being quote unquote, you know, religious, but, um, you know, they want you to be inclusive. And, and I think that, the, um, so I feel supported in our industry, but it's getting harder and harder, um, just in general, you know, I mean, you guys know, as, as believers, it's, it's getting harder and harder, but, you know, we live in a great country and, um, and the, the level of persecution that we maybe sense is nothing, uh, compared to the rest of the world, um, or, or what many generations before us have suffered for advancing the gospel in Christ. And um, so I think it's a badge of honor when you, when you have persecution or resistance of like, you're fighting the good fight for the right reasons. And you know, this, this matters. Yeah. Excellent. I love what you said about um, the taming down of Christianity and uh, just hearing you speak, hearing your testimony, hearing your, your stand and your dependence on Christ uh, is is a picture of not being tame in your faith. And uh, part of being a better man is that we embrace what it means fully to follow Jesus. And uh, we chase after him and run after him with everything we've got. And you, you model that in so many ways, and you've modeled that in our conversation today so so thank you very much uh friends michael we've come to the end of our time uh a last comment that's just come in the chat is go win the 500 <laughs> yeah yeah well that's what i'm here to do um looking forward to it thanks for having me on if, if you're good with it they're about to start this truck race it's gonna get loud but uh let me close this in prayer thank you guys so much for inviting me um and to be a part of the the better man event and this uh this opportunity to speak with you guys and uh for everybody listening thanks for having me on uh lord i just pray that um that you would just help us to to be better men to lead our families well uh to reflect your goodness and your faithfulness and that we would um we'd make an impact in our homes and our communities and our workplace uh, wherever you have us, Lord, I just pray that we would be good, faithful stewards of what you've given us, um, that we would be able to uh, fully uh, show people what it means to follow Christ. And, and even when it's messy uh, and we miss the mark and, and we don't have it all together, that you are good uh, and that you're faithful. So I just pray that you'd help strengthen us to be good leaders, uh, to be the men you've called us to be, and that uh, we would impact the kingdom in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Michael, thank, thank you, you so much. You model what a better man is for us. Friends, thank you so much for joining us today. We would encourage you uh, to share this video. It will be up for a long time on uh, Facebook. We'll put it on our website. We'd love for you to go to our website and lots of opportunities to grow, connect, and become a better man in your discipleship. Michael, thank you, guys. Thank you. And we hope to see you real soon. Take care. God bless. Thank you.